passport, you can take it off your book. Wise words of a wise Briton. While men go down to the sea in ships, fight to keep open the ocean trails, others take up the fight on land. Here is the record of one small band who gathered together in South Africa, who cheerfully faced 13,000 miles of jungle, forest, and swamps, who ignored the dangers of tropical disease, of wild creatures of unknown tribes, in a territory vast and still the least known, the least healthy to explore of all the Earth's surface. He was busy with the wheel walk when our cameras picked us up in the mud of southern Rhodesia. Our goal is Egypt and our object to blaze a new trail between the fighting dominion of South Africa and the desert land of the north, where men of the empire have formed a human blockade around the area so vital to the strategy of the United Nations. The Karu tribe of southern Rhodesia. They are not in the least hostile and not at all shy of the cameras. We don't refer to Africa as the dark continent now. The adjective fascinating seems more apt, and discovering such an unexpected corner as this on our first stop lends point to it. It's called Zimbabwe. All records of its history have slipped from sight, although some say it dates to the Queen of Sheba's day. It's a small, strongly fortified area, once used as a camp by the men who sought Africa's gold. If the natives know more, they won't tell except to insist that it houses the devil. After sunset, it's taboo and no fooling. As we leave the spot that history left behind, we find ourselves still in southern Odisha, and with plane sailing to Bulawayo. It's a little more water and it would be sailing. Bulawayo, Bishop Scotland. Africa, Hertfordshire. The British Isles and part of British Africa, linked by the name Cecil John Rose. Here in Bulawayo, the Empire Statesman Empire Builder died and was buried after 30 years of trailblazing. And though our motor vehicles have replaced his oxen teams, the obstacles remain. The stops are frequent, the pace is slow, and the native with spade mighty welcome. Well, here it is, a little more water. We've reached the river depth in northern Rhodesia. Our northbound convoy may not have to worry about submarines or dive bombers, but we do have to guide our trail to the river's edge at a point where bridge building will be practicable. For those who are to follow, depend quite as much on skill as courage. For instance, we aim for this point on the depth with its weir and shallow water. securely driven in to mark the crossing of another barrier, the party rests near the north bank of the net. We've reached the home of a northern Rhodesian pioneer, one who did his trail ranging in the days of Victoria the Good, when Africa was a dark continent. Joe Robbins' only company, the only company he wants, is that of his tail wagon. He playfully calls them my Pekingese. While farmers in other parts of the world worry about foxes raiding their chicken roosts, Joe worries about the lions walking off of his cattle. Hence the stockade. The Great Danes are expert at baying the lion and holding it until Joe gets a beat with his shooting iron. Our last stopping place in the Rhodesias is a very large, a very modern cattle run with an excellent herd of longhorn beasts. 
They are subject to the same ailments as their breed everywhere, plus those peculiar to Central Africa. And on this Rhodesian farm, the power of modern times is fully organized to protect them. Reminiscent of the range throughout the world is this cattle dip. It's a chemical bath, unwelcome but beneficial in combating the threat of foot and mouth disease and other afflictions. Our camera recorded several interesting and widely divergent examples of that word power. First, the ancient motive power of the bullet train. And then we spotted this iron horse. Rather ancient too compared with the coronation scarf, but a welcome sight to those whose trail has been and will soon be again the swamp and jungle with every foot of fight against snakes. A half day of speedy travel for a change as our trail converges with others from north, south and east. We've reached a corner of civilization, the halfway mark. And where would we pitch our camp in the Tanganyika territory if not by the roaring waters of Victoria Falls? Power. 350 feet down. Twice the depth of Niagara. hundred yards across, capable of generating 12 million horsepower. Trains pass a mile and a half away and are wet with the spray. If you're born inside that distance, they tell me you come into the world complete with matches on. later, we reached the wartime camp of a famous native regiment. A few months ago, they were raw recruits, savages, some of them. But to the strong arm and fleet foot of the natives have been added the knowledge of modern warfare, tactics, the coordination of movement and effort. To British officers goes the credit for making excellent men, excellent soldiers. One of their officers said, loyalty is the one thing we can't teach these men. They've got it to the fullest degree. They never let you down. Manpower. The power of the intellect. Greatest of all. We've left it all behind. The wonder of the world's greatest foes. The road, railway, the homes of white men. Our trail has crossed and parted company with the rest. And again, we're on our solitary way. With the echo of the falls still in our ears, we manipulate one of the deep streams which feeds the forest. We knew that once across, we'd enter the land of the Awemba tribe. Nothing to worry about, they're quite friendly but they do have several quaint notions. One of them concerns their holy men. They believe that the feet of their religious leaders are holy, far different from those of mortal men, so far above the earth, in fact, that they must never touch them. And they see that they don't. Sitting, lying, standing, or walking, they're always to be found on special men. And here they are, after 200 of a 500-mile trek, to powwow with a white sheep. Naturally, when they feel that way about it, the business of weaving that features largely in their workaday activities. The reeds they use are tough, hard wearing, and the tribe's handiwork reaches many parts of the world. Nothing shy about these folks. We asked one of them to weave for the camera, and all of a sudden, half a dozen decided they had some back work to catch up on. Well, uh, wouldn't you like to be so star too? On 
the north boundary of the territory the Awembos call home sweet home, we face an obstacle that just about decides us to call that territory our home, too. You've heard of hacking your way through jungle. Well, this is what it means. A hundred feet an hour, if you're lucky. There's a marked resemblance here to the Malayan and Burmese jungle. If you add to the natural dangers of disease and wild creatures, those of a treacherous and cunning enemy, you've got some slight idea of what British troops face in the East Indies. A good night's rest was had and earned by all. Before sunrise next morning, breakfast is finished, and another camp in the African jungle is being struck. Travel light is the first rule of still waiting. The second is what you have to take must be light. The party's tents, bedding, utensils for a 13,000-mile journey are packed into a single lorry. No more than you take for a week of flaxen. But as we set off, storm cloud. With the speed of a panther, the storm broke. Our cameras under cover for safety, we crawled through a day torrential rain, a real Hollywood storm, covering less miles than hours of travel. Then the cool, quiet evening followed, and we pitched our tents just where our mechanical style decided to rest themselves the clock. By the dawn's early light, the natives answer our call for help and start to work on this bridge. It was demolished the day before by the fast-moving water stolen by the storm. We decide to ferry part of the equipment over by hand. The lighter the lorry load, the better, for we aren't any too happy about that bridge. be long now. And she's over. Another river crossed, another obstacle clear. The band Piccolo player showed us how to tap that dangerous piece, the Chapter Loaf, Harry Cat. Caterpillar to you. At first we figured he was showing off, or just keeping his toes nice and sharp. <laughs> Nearby, we reach the shore of a beautiful Tanganyika Lake. While the chef and head waiter prepare anything but the sushi pie, our camera does its best to take in the huge expanse of warm, fair water. sent our dainty neighbors to the bush in search of their midday meal. No self-respecting camera could travel through Africa without spotting the picturesque, hand-painted zebra and the lazy lioness taking her for yes. Those ugly birds of prey, the vultures, watching, then swooping down to pick clean the bones of a lion's victim. With luck, you'll see a piper. That is, without him to be And with more luck, you'll steer clear of the sipsy fly, more dangerous than most animals. A chameleon, one of the lower of 70 types of lizard. He has an adhesive, lightning fast, and telescopic tongue. It flashes out to capture insects six inches away. The centipede rolling along like the latest edition tank. And here's the granddaddy of your garden spider. He's all grown up and no one to bite. On every hand, friend and foe, the graceful flamingo. And then we swung the camera on to another and more familiar friend, the giraffe. At first glance, he looks as unreal and awkward as worrying about his neck. I don't know what he's good for, except to keep the tops of trees trim, but I do know he's among the most graceful of animals, with a balance so perfect 
that he can canter like that for miles with a glass of water on his head and not spill a drop. No, Mabel, I didn't try it, but that's what the book says. Here, my friends, is a tropical specimen, product of the Musa Sapienta. Remember? I would, too, if I got that close to one. The Springbok, two feet tall, with delicate pointed horns, and with the heart of a lion. It'll tackle any creature it doesn't like the look of. When hunted, it puts the dogs off the scent by taking enormous leaps, then hiding, and when the dogs are past, it's of the same family as the robot found in stuff. With the Springbok here, and with dark and lustrous eyes, the Eastern poet sings of... My lady with the lustrous eyes of a timid gazelle. Try it on the girlfriend, Joe, and see what happens. Incidentally, the fastest dog is left far behind by these wee animals, and so the natives hunt them with hawks. Birds are trained to dive down on the coming. And here's another friend, as familiar as the giraffe and a lot more useful. There are just two kinds of elephants, very big and very much bigger. As much man's friend and helpmate. A pleasant bloke, too, but rather sensitive. In time to resent it, for instance, when you do a snatch with their touch. That's why, when these native cats return from a four day hunt, we congratulated them, both on bringing home the ivory and coming home. During the hunt, they live on elephant meat, warm, juicy steak, eaten as they're cut from the carcass. And so, while the timid springbok ducks behind the tree and breathes a sigh of relief that he hadn't grown tusk, we pack up the kit and start up the hill. We're on the road again, headed north. Sorry, south. It's a one in three grade. The car won't take it, the brakes won't hold it, so down we come, making for something that will, and does. Well, that's fine. That's just well. Having put it in, all we need to do now is get it out, find the damage. we find a tree with a sturdy foot, and in it, we manage to straighten the axle after heating it in our campfire. downhill backwards. Only a few hours elapsed till we had the repairs completed, the rear end reassembled, and we're on our way again north. We thought it best to make sure this time. We sent out an SOS, and to limping Lena's stall with an insufficient 20 horsepower, we add 400 megapowers. Not that it matters at all, but here's the aerial we use to send that SOS. Yep, it's north. Up the hill we go, and finally we are stopped again. The lady member of the party feels that after all the kind help this tribe has given us, the least we can do in return is scrub the chief's monk. <laughs> thinking, why pick on me? If you're so darn grateful for the help, why not go scrub, powder, and brush the teeth? Mm -hmm. 
American natives by the sea type, but members of this tribe spend as much time on the water as in the jungle. Mangala. Not much to look at, but very good to see. For each evening as we'd made camp and planned the next day's route, our thoughts and eyes had turned to this dot on the map. Here, we knew, was our first crossing of the Nile, over the shallow waters which characterize the famous river as it runs north through the Anglo-Egyptian Sudan. Now we're emerging from the jungle of Central Africa, and we enter the southern limits of the desert country. The steep bank has to be cut away to the level of our terrace. Land that borders the Nile on its southern reach. Three rivers in quick succession here, two of them unknown quantities. That really would tax our party's trailblazing skills. We're in the Dinka country, home of the folk who live in the swamp, and with whose help we hope to... As it turned out, we found the ladies willing to pose and act, and the men folk equally willing to use their strong arms on the end of a rope instead of a spear. Their town had straight across the river, and once over, they promised to show us their new city hall. And so, expressing polite interest, we got on with the job of stopping. Crocodiles are quiet when they are fast asleep and dreaming or wide awake and thinking hard. Well, these potential suitcases are not sleeping and easy yet with their thinking. That's why our chief speeded up operation. He knew the native's eyes were wide open for the first sign of movement from that quarter. If it came, they'd go. And then perhaps that precious glory would be stored in the African drink for the duration. Bouncing beneath her bounce right out of Ethiopia, 
The mighty fascist empire is a memory of poison gas and patriot chieftains like this one thrown from Italian planes. The protector of Islam, well, he took it on the land. No wonder they died. The bride-to-be tears up on her 12-cylinder dromedary, followed at a respectful distance by her retinue. Now, for some Ethiopian reason, it's customary for the several bridesmaids to travel to church on the lowly bullet, and he's also entrusted with a portable wedding bell. In fact, his whole get-up was so elaborate, you think he was getting married. With a little more zip, the warrior attendants trailed away for the groom, and he arrives for the ceremony complete with sword, spear, and coat of mail, the whole thing going in the back. We found it wasn't so much a matter of caution as pride. He invited us to shoot him as close up as the look in his horse's eye would let us get. A beautifully carved sword there, but no toy as several sore eyes had become. The chain mail has been in his family since one of his ancestors acquired it from a crusader. With the arrival of the groom, the procession forms and heads for the tiny church. And it's quite an impressive life. Since they're going in the direction our well-worn compass says is north, we follow and part company as the little lady herself dismounts to enter the church and become Mrs. Patriot Peak. May they be as happy as their Ethiopia is free. Back in the Anglo-Egyptian Sudan. Oh, yes, we've been making good time. We pause while Arab nomads map the road to our next stopping place. Here are the firm packed trends over which our empire forces roll to the relief of Haile Selassie's nation. Another day and the end of our trailblazing. The roads we travel now are long since on the map. They aid the great river in linking town with town, ancient and modern, to the good earth of the Nile Valley. Egypt and the towering gates of Luxor, a town built long before the days of Tutankhamun and rebuilt by Alexander the Great. Well, that's so exactly what one expects of an Egyptian scene that we might as well have barged in on a Hollywood to find Cecil B. putting sails in the face. El Aksur is the ancient name of the town. It means the cup. The avenue of rams leads to the temple, and nearby are the ruins of Thebes and the tombs of the Pharaohs. Some intact, some in ruins, the tombs of the wise rulers of the civilized world of thousands of years ago. Those were the days when the seer and Sandaliner saw in the distant future our dive-bound civilization of today. Surrounded now with signs of civilization, theirs and ours, we reach journey's end with the end of the day. And on a hilltop, we take our leave of the everlasting night. 13,000 miles. Quite a